we can find great encouragement that uh, if you find this abuser uh, to have brought great harm to you, well, Jesus also stands opposed to that harm and condemns that sort of harm, uh, that this is not what those who are representing God are supposed to do. This is not the warmest and fuzziest topic coming from the religious abuse side of the conversation, for sure. Now, I know this can come up all over the place, of course, but I just had, for example, this morning, I was working on some continuing education for a presentation I'm giving in a couple weeks about the science of trauma and what happens in people's bodies and all this kind of stuff that I'm into because I'm a licensed mental health professional. So, you know, all of that stuff. And as I'm listening to all this information, I'm like, this is, God was what my dad used as his excuse to be physically abusive. And he used the Old Testament to support it. And so did everybody else. And it wasn't just my dad Other men and adult women in the group were also able to be physically abusive. So it's not that, you know, you're just getting beaten even by your own parent, all these other people. And again, it was the Old Testament that was used for it. Now, I am so thankful for people like you who write books like you have, who help people like me to get that figured out and to untwist it all and figure out what is actually God and what is actually humanity. Because Where I went this morning, when I had that response of goodness, like it hurt because our heads and our hearts aren't always exactly on the same page. So we can still feel some of the pain, but I knew in that moment, Lord, you're who I go to because you're my safe place. Mm -hmm. You're the one who comforts and protects and is always here. And I know that. And so you're the one I'm going to go spend time with this morning as I'm feeling this pain, because I know it was not you. I know who it was. And so I wanted to start this conversation off by sharing that because at first this morning I was like, oh, this might be a hard conversation for me today because I'm just, I'm feeling some things today. But again, I know who to ascribe what to. And again, it is because of people like you that I can do that. So welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it, Naomi. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. And for those listening, usually I do an introduction a little bit in, but I want to pause um, quickly now because it seems appropriate to do so and introduce you to Dr. Paul Copan. So his background, he has a Bachelor's of Arts in Biblical Studies from Columbia International University, a Master of Arts in Philosophy of Religion, and a Master of Divinity, both from Trinity International University, and a PhD in Philosophy from Marquette University. He's been a visiting scholar at Oxford, which is really cool. And he's the author and editor editor of over 30 books, including Is God a Moral Monster? Understanding the Old Testament of God. And his newest, which will have been released by the time this episode airs, Is God a Vindictive Bully? For six years, he served as the president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and he regularly speaks on university campuses, at conferences, church groups. He and his wife, Jacqueline, they have six children and they live in Florida. So please keep Florida in your prayers again. When this episode comes out, we might not be quite through all this yet, but his personal website is paulcopan.com. For those of you who are new to Be Emboldened as well, I just want to touch on that. Thank you so much for being here. We exist for those impacted by religious trauma by providing support for prevention and victimization, prevention of victimization and re-victimization, creating a safe space to ask questions and to heal. You can learn more and support this work in the resources we offer, support groups, virtual courses, healing-focused getaways by visiting beembolden.com. So with that, I want to jump into our first question. And again, to give a little context for it, It can be difficult, understandably, for those who have experienced true religious abuse to believe that God is good. It can be hard to believe that. They've had God in the Bible used against them as a weapon for control and other forms of personal gain by leadership. So what evidence do we have for the goodness of God? Well, the main evidence is, for one, the giving of Jesus Christ, his son, for us. 
rather than coming into the world to punish, uh, he comes into the world to save. As John 3 reminds us uh, that God didn't send this, his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so we see here the very heart of God, which is mercy, compassion, love. Doesn't mean that wrath is excluded, but God desires to show mercy and compassion, that this is his heartbeat. And of course, it begins in uh, the very gift of creation that God brings human beings into existence, uh, allows them to enter into his relationship as Father, Son, and Spirit of joy and love and celebration. And even when human beings go astray, uh, God continues to seek them out. God makes a covenant with, uh, with Abraham uh, with the promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. And so this is, you know, we see that God is a missionary God, a God who reaches out, uh, a God who, even though human beings turn away from him, still pursues and persists and uh, and uh, endures uh, rejection, endures the uh, the you know, repudiation, for example, of, of Israel uh, against him. Uh, and so he says things like in, in Ezekiel, uh, how I have been hurt by their adulterous hearts. So we see that God longs to show compassion, uh, but there comes a time when God also says, uh, that's it. And when people continue to dehumanize, when people continue to uh, act violently toward one another, uh, when people uh, undermine the image of God in each person, uh, then God's wrath, which we can perhaps translate his passionate concern, arises. And so this is also a manifestation of the love of God, that wrath is not an opposition to a God, but actually or to God's love, but it's actually a manifestation of that love expressed in that deep concern that he has for uh, the creatures he's made. Mm. So almost always passages have been cherry picked from scripture by abusive leaders. So for example, the verses you just shared, those don't really come up. Different ones come up. So they'll point to God's wrath, but without his mercy, um, they'll point to the slaughters, of course, of the Old Testament without context and explanation. And essentially, they leave Jesus out of the picture entirely, which is really, really blew my mind when I like growing up in comparison to after attending seminary and things like that. I'm like, you know, yeah, I believed in Jesus, but we didn't really talk about Jesus. He was just sort of over there. Um, I don't think Jesus really helped the agenda a whole lot. So taking the Old Testament and the New Testament as a whole, though, as it should be, how would you guide someone to reconcile this min misconception of the Old Testament accounts in relation to the New Testament account with Jesus? Right. Well, I think it's important to remember that, as we talked about, wrath is not something that is just restricted to the Old Testament and then disappears in the New uh, Paul writes in Romans 11.22, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. So Paul recognizes that there are, uh, that though God longs to show compassion and mercy, uh, there is still a, uh, there are people who act in ways that defy the, you know, not just God's standards you know, more generally, but uh, that bring harm to those who are his image bearers and so forth. And, and, and those who mislead others, Jesus himself said, again, out of a spirit of concern and protectiveness, uh, in Matthew 18, 6, he says that it'd be better for those who lead these little ones astray to have a millstone hung around their necks and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's how Jesus stands up for those who are the vulnerable, those who, uh, especially within the kingdom uh, of uh, you know, his kingdom, uh, that uh, and even in the Old Testament, of course, there's the carryover uh, from there where God is concerned about the orphan, the widow, the alien, uh, those who could be most uh, easily taken advantage of in society. So you see that concern for the marginalized, for the vulnerable uh, across both Testaments. And, uh, and this is why we see Jesus as having such a, uh, a marvelous uh, connecting point uh, for so many people. Uh, but again, we we as Jesus comes in, 
uh, to the picture, we we see that uh, there is a certain what should we say uh, you know, a, a certain concern that many people have because Jesus, as C.S. Lewis said, is good, but he is not safe. In other words, you do not take Jesus lightly. Uh, you do not dismiss him. You do not uh, think, oh, I can get away with this. Uh, Jesus is, uh, a, he's loving and kind and compassionate, so I can do what I want. And the doctrine of grace can often be abused, uh, that it can be you know, that Paul Paul challenges this when he says, shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? Uh, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And so Paul uh, reminds us of, of this theme that grace is not something that is a, you can do whatever you want, kind of cheap discipleship, uh, but rather it is something that should inspire us to living lives of gratitude, uh, to seeking to live lives that are pleasing, to God, and that out of that gratitude, uh, you know, out of that grace comes a spirit of gratitude that serves God and others, uh, because we've recognized how God has been gracious to us. Uh, so, so there is a severity to Jesus, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, but, uh, but we need to understand the the kind of heart that Jesus is expressing. While he is the one who is, as Revelation 9 says, or Revelation 12 says, uh, he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, he's the sovereign ruler. But he is also, on the other hand, uh, for those who are repentant, for those who are uh, putting their trust in him, uh, he is the one who will not break a bruised reed and will not snuff out a smoldering wick. Uh, he is the good and gentle shepherd who calls his sheep by name, but he's also one who will defend them and will act in ways that will uh, may seem ferocious uh, to others, but it is for the general well-being uh, of them and also bringing justice to those who are uh, abusing and maligning and so forth. So God promises that he will render to everyone according to his deeds. And, and if we look at the Old Testament, we can talk about some of these issues that are just kind of plunked down, say warfare in the Old Testament, uh, without further considerations for who were the Canaanites, what kind of lifestyle did they engage in? When we look at them, we see incest, bestiality, ritual prostitution, uh, infant sacrifice, uh, actually to be considered criminal in any civilized society and to keep Israel from being uh, affected by them and being and losing their own way uh, and, uh, and and losing sight of their own mission and identity. God is also seeking to protect them from this contamination while sim simultaneously bringing judgment as they're, to, as they're to be driven from the land. But God also waits patiently for over 500 years uh, before, until the sin of the Amorites, the Canaanites, is completed, Genesis 15 says. So it's not precipitous action. It is a slow building to that point where finally God says enough. And it is also uh, something that you know, God would rather show mercy, kindness, compassion to the Canaanites, uh, that he would desire their salvation, not just in the long run, but even in, in the short run. Uh, so we have somebody like Rahab uh, in Joshua 2 and ch chapter 6 as well, where she puts her trust in the God who has made himself plainly known. The Canaanites are well, well aware of what this God has done in Egypt, the signs and wonders that were there, delivering them from the from, from Pharaoh through the Red Sea, bringing them across the Jordan River on dry, dry ground. So, so they know there's testimony. We know what your God has done, Rahab tells the spies. And even later on in chapter eight, we see that there are these Canaanites who are part of a covenant renewal ceremony in, uh, in, in Shechem, where Joshua's reading the law and these strangers are part of that covenant renewal ceremony. So joining up with Israel, uh, we see the Gibeonites later on in chapter nine. And then uh, even in chapter 11, it says that there was not a king out of all the Canaanites who sought to make peace with Israel. So here's this. Uh, basically uh, putting out there that they could have made peace with Israel if they wanted to. The main concern was not God's uh, ethnic, some sort of ethnic hostility against the Canaanites. Canaanites and Israelites were 
you know, it's very hard to tell them apart. Uh, but what was at issue was what they stood for. Uh, think in terms of Nazi Germany. And I know I'm going on quite a long bit about this, but trying to offer some broad context mm-hmm. uh, that um, John and Harvey Walton talk about how God is more interested in uh, the D, uh, what should we say? Uh, de-immoralizing the Canaanites. Uh, God is more interested in removing those identity markers that keep them entrenched in their uh, patterns of behavior that are immoral and that have a pernicious effect on those around them. And so God is more concerned about getting rid of those the the symbols uh, and identifying markers that keep them locked into their way of life. And it's kind of like with Nazi Germany, John and Hardy Walton use this example, that uh, that when the Allies won the war in the Second World War, that the Allies removed all of these symbols of Nazi identification, of Nazi identity, uh, the hierarchy, the symbols, the flags, the the monuments, and so forth. All of those things were taken down, but the came, the the German people uh, were pretty much uh, intact. Uh, you know, those who died, you know, there are people who died fighting and so forth, but largely the, the German peoples, uh, you know, survived as a nation and continued on. Uh, but again, those identifying markers were what the allied uh, nations were concerned about removing those things so as not to repeat that ideology and the sorts of dangers that were associated with it. So those are some things that are that we ought to keep in mind when we look at the broader picture. And one of the things that I am often talking about as we look at these battle accounts is that you know, there's no genocide involved here. Uh, there's a lot of exaggeration and even language that's used, sweeping language of man, woman, young and old. Uh, well, you don't have to, have, you know, there are no women and children that are actually there. Uh, on on these battle sites, uh, they're usually the first ones to flee, and uh, you can have mention of a battle. I'll give an example in one place where you have the uh, these two kings in in Numbers twenty one who are going, uh, who are kings that uh, Moses asks if we can just pass through your land peacefully. They rise up, they oppose Moses and take up arms to fight against the Israelites. And so they're defeated. And it says the king, his sons, and his army are fighting against the Israelite army. Uh, You get to Deuteronomy and the language is intensified. So when you look at it, you say, whoa, this is uh, is kind of stunning. But, But it says in where this battle is recounted, it says... Uh, it, Deuteronomy 2 and 3, it says, it mentions man, woman, young and old, but this is part of the, the sweeping language, the hyperbolic, hyperbolic language, the exaggerated language that is being used, that there were no uh, non-combatants uh, present, but yet it uses that kind of sweeping language, which was part of the ancient Near Eastern trash talk, where where you say, we totally annihilated those guys, like in a sports analogy, even though you'd have lots of survivors. So that's the kind of thing that's going on. These are kind of standard battles that are taking place, uh, but with a certain purpose that God has in mind to, uh, again, with the ultimate end of the salvation of the world. But in the meantime, those who are Canaanites can certainly join up with the Israelites. They don't have to uh, to defy the God who, who they know is superior to their own gods and so forth. So those are a few things to keep in mind as we uh, look at some of those challenging passages. Yes, absolutely. And for anyone who's listening, who's thinking, well, maybe you guys are just making that up because it feels better for you. (laughs) Uh, We even have evidence that there was intermarrying then later, you know, in future chapters. And so if everyone was really taken out, women, children, everyone was gone, that wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. So we have things that wouldn't make sense later on in scripture if everyone had actually been killed. Yeah, right. So that's why you have, for example, mention of uh, in just if you look at well, Joshua is a typical war text which does have that standard exaggeration. But what's unique about Joshua, as well as other war accounts, is that it also mentions survivors. You see, Egypt and Assyria in the ancient Near East, they wouldn't have, they don't mention survivors. They talk about how they were all wiped out. All the enemies were wiped out. In Israel's battle accounts, in fact, even in Joshua, we we see that there are many other nations that are still living in in the land uh, that need to be driven out, and that uh, in in Judges, 
chapter one, we read repeatedly that the Israelites could not drive them out, could not drive them out, could not drive them out. So, so if you take the the hyperbolic accounts literally, then they would stand in gross contradiction to what we'll see a chapter or two later, or just even verses later uh, in in Joshua, Judges, and so forth. So it's important to to keep those factors in mind as we look at that, that if you understand that there's this exaggeration, when you see lots of survivors, you don't say, oh, there's a contradiction. No, it's just the way language was used back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a form of storytelling. I mean, mm -hmm. we all, we joke about like the, the fish stories and stuff, right? Like, oh, I caught this mm -hmm. fish and it was this big. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it wasn't. You caught this little minnow, but anyway. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I want to jump back to um, briefly to what you had said in the beginning about God is sacrificing his son. And I'm hearing that through the ears of different people that I meet with. Mm -hmm. right. So I want to go back to that because what can happen, as I'm sure you've heard, is people will see Jesus as the good guy and God the Father as the bad guy. Right. And then we'll see if we head in a progressive direction. Now we've got cosmic child abuse. So we've kind of, you know, we've spiraled from there. So do you mind if we go back to that? And would Absolutely you not. That'd be fine. explain more of what you intended by that? Sure. Sure. When we talk about God um, not coming to punish, but to take punishment. And what we see is it's a, it's certainly Jesus is not uh, the hapless victim of, say, God the Father's wrath, because we see, for example, in John 3.16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave, not God so hated the world uh, or something like that. Uh, and that Jesus throws himself into, you know, in between God, the Father, and the world uh, to, to save us. No, it is, this is a the, the plan of the triune God. Jesus has come for this very purpose. And in John 10, we read that Jesus, as the good shepherd, does not have his own life taken from him. He lays it down of his own accord, and he takes it up again. So as we look at the cross, we don't see some sort of a, uh, a victim status here. Jesus self-sacrificially lays down his life for us. And this is no cosmic child abuse. Uh, rather than seeing it as three parties, God, the Son, God the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the world, we should see this as two parties, namely a loving but also just God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and a world in rebellion against him. And so rather than coming to uh, destroy the rebels, God steps in, and as Romans chapter 5 tells us, that while we were enemies at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So there is no, uh, you know, rather than coming in and punishing enemies, Jesus comes in uh, gives up his life self-sacrificially for the sake of his enemies, saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, and takes it up again. Uh, but in this process, we see that, as 2 Corinthians 5 says, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that this is an act of the triune God, that the Father himself is involved in this process, and so it, we ought not to pit father against son, but rather to see this as the plan of the triune God from eternity and that Jesus voluntarily gives himself for us, laying down his life for his enemies and turning those enemies into friends, reconciling us to himself. So it's a beautiful picture of a God who, uh, rather than as you've as, you, as you've said, uh, engaging in some sort of cosmic child abuse, uh, the triune God is actually involved in an act of love, but without compromising the, the standards of justice and uh, and, uh, and and goodness uh, in doing so. So we see uh, we see love and justice coming together at the cross, and that Jesus pays the the legal penalty for us that his his merits. Uh, his righteousness is credited to our account that we could not do anything. What we could not do in ourselves, 
Jesus Christ accomplishes on our behalf, that this is God's achievement, and that what we see in the cross, uh, and this is, uh, this is spelled out in the Gospel of John in, in very significant terms, where Jesus says, now the Son of Man is glorified. And that in this act, you know, what is that? What he's talking about? He's talking about the cross that's coming up. That the son, using the language of Isaiah 52, you're, you know, the serpent will be lifted up and highly exalted. Uh, that Jesus is going to be lifted up onto the cross. And he says, when I'm lifted up, uh, there's a kind of a double uh, intention here, uh, lifted up on the cross, but also has that picture of exaltation. I will draw all people to myself. So Jesus is talking about his crucifixion, talking about his moment of being lifted up on the cross, which is his precisely his moment of glorification. In other words, the great achievement of God is seen precisely at the very lowest point that you can come, namely death on a cross, dying naked uh, you know, at a, in a public place at, by crucifixion, a barbaric practice in the, in the Roman world. And so Jesus is willing to go to such depths to rescue us. So when we look at the cross, we see how low God is willing to go for our salvation. It's a wonderful picture of his grace, of his love, and how this is what is to be seen as the big picture. Uh, the heart of God is, is loving. Uh, God desires to, to show us that love and for us to be reconciled to him rather than to rebel against him, to to turn away from him, uh, to refuse to repent from our wrongdoings. Uh, this is the path. And if we, we take that path, what well, Jesus says, you know, come to me, you are weary, I will give you rest. Uh, that uh, we create a lot of restless for, restlessness for ourselves when we oppose the purposes of God, when we refuse to acknowledge our own wrongdoing and cast ourselves upon the mercy of God. Yeah, it's really, it's such an amazing, incredible picture. And you said it so well. So thank you. And there's a couple of things that I think trip people up here and where it sends them off in one of a couple of not, you know, unfortunate directions. And one is when someone has had God used incorrectly, God used against them, God weaponized against them in not, not in the truth of his wrath not in the truth of his character, the truth of his justice, but in a way that is completely just, yeah, it's abusive. And so when that happens, oftentimes the person who has done it is a loved person. It's a trusted person. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately to place the blame properly can be the same as admitting some really awful things about family members, mm -hmm loved ones, just people you've trusted your whole life. Mm -hmm. That's not easy to do. And so I think where people right. can get tripped up is it's easier to blame God because mm -hmm. God isn't literally standing in front of them where they have to have an audible conversation. So there's mm -hmm. something that can seemingly feel removed, even though really God's the closest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the spirit's literally indwelling. You can't get closer than that, but it doesn't necessarily seem that way. And so it can be easier mm -hmm. to blame God than to blame the person who's actually accountable. Right. And so I think that's one thing that can go wrong. I think the other thing that can go wrong is people trying to, and understandably so, make the Trinity something that they that is more tangible to them, something that they can understand in our, you know, human terms exactly, you know, how all the metaphors kind of fall short. Mm -hmm. It's like, gosh, mm -hmm. there's a uniqueness to the Trinity. We don't have this perfect example that we can share outside of the Trinity itself. And it makes me think of this, like St. Patrick. I don't know if you've seen that little video, <laughs> but yeah. with the Lutheran satire. Come on, Patrick. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes you say that well. I have seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's another piece of it is, okay, we're trying to have it make sense in our terms. And all of a sudden we're falling into modalism or partialism, or we're falling into these other things mm -hmm. by accident. And that's how we end up with this oh, well, God did this to God, the father did this to God, the son. And now all of a sudden I'm seeing that as in, oh, my father would kill my sister for my God, my, you know, and things kind of derail from there. And, but again, I think what I see most often would be the first one. And that's, well, it's easier to blame God and say that God is the bad guy than it is to say that my father was a cult leader and abused people. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, right. it's true. It is easier, but it's not accurate. 
and it has really significant consequences because if, if God is real for those who are listening, if God is real, it's the most important question. Like it's the most, there's nothing more important. And so we have to take that seriously and it takes humility and it's going to, it's people are going to feel some things. It does feel like suffering. It's painful. And yet, fortunately, you know, organizations like this exist that could come alongside people in that. Hmm. But indeed, yeah. Well, let me, if I just might comment uh, briefly on that, I think you're you're right that there's often this transference to God that um, God is to be blamed for these things. Well, what and I've interacted with people who have said, "How could God allow, say, my again, not just religious abuse?" And we could talk about how Jesus Himself is, you know, His chief opponents were those who were religious abusers, right. uh, those who. Uh, laid all these great burdens upon their their you know the their the layperson the, their followers, uh, but yet didn't lift a finger to ease those burdens, and so Jesus is rebuking them uh, for this sort of hypocrisy, and uh, and so he speaks very forcefully against them, and I think we can find great encouragement that uh, if you find this abuser. Uh, to have brought great harm to you. Well, Jesus also stands opposed to that harm and condemns that sort of harm, uh, that this is not what those who are representing God are supposed to do. In fact, Jesus says in John 16 that they're going to, or you know, 15, that there are going to be people who are, you know, they th they think that they're doing God a favor by uh, persecuting believers. And so there is a uh, uh, that common association. Oh, this is being done in the name of God. Therefore, I've got to I've got to blame God. Whereas God Himself distances his, Himself from those uh, those particular acts. Uh, God doesn't want the credit for those things. He repudiates those. And uh, and, and if they lead, to, of course, as I said before, Jesus condemns that kind of a thing. That they should be uh, have a, have a millstone hung around their necks and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's how forcefully Jesus speaks against that. Uh, but but it's also important to remember. Uh, when it comes to say the Trinity, one analogy that I found helpful, not originally with me, not original with me, but it's the example of you know, the analogy of Cerberus, the three-headed dog of Greek mythology. And we do have actually indications in nature of say two-headed snakes or turtles or the like, where you have two centers of awareness within one, in this, in these cases, uh, biological uh beings. Uh, you know, and so you have, and so with with this dog analogy, you have three centers of awareness, but yet it is ultimately a unified being. It's not as though you can maybe cut off one head and then have have you know have the dog intact. No, all three come together as a as a package. So it is an indivisible being, but yet there is distinction within that unity. And so, if God, being a soulish being, uh, a spirit being uh, can have though one substance, one being uh, still can have three centers of awareness within. So it's not as though there can be this internal contradiction of father opposing son and so forth. Uh, and, and so this helps us as we understand what is happening at the cross that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that this is the act of the triune God that uh, that when Jesus says, you know, Father, forgive them that don't know what they're doing, uh, we have to, you know, we have to see that God is involved in this process. And even when Jesus says, uh, why have you forsaken me? We ought to understand this as simply a reflection of the anguish of Jesus, reflecting what David was saying in Psalm 22, when he was opposed and when there is hostility against him. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, that Jesus says before he goes to the cross, he tells his disciples, in, in the Gospel of John, he says uh, in, in chapter 16, he says, even though you know, he says that even though you will leave me alone, he tells the disciples, yet I am not alone for my father is with me. So uh, and, and even on the cross, he's saying, Father, forgive them. Uh, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit and so forth. So there is still that connection between Father, Son and Spirit. And as I said, quoting from Paul uh, in Second Corinthians 5, that in this act of crucifixion, God is not God. The Father is not removed from the Son. He's actually very present at the crucifixion, and that's why Paul says that God was in Christ 
reconciling the world to himself, not abandoning his son, but actually being there in this act of reconciliation. Mm, That's an important clarification because, yeah, that gets confusing. Absolutely. I want to head in a little bit of a different direction. Many share their experience of the Old Testament uh, being used to create a hierarchy within humanity. Mm -hmm. So in value and worth. So one race having more value than another, one superior group over another, this us versus them mentality between denominations Mm -hmm. or between, you know, uh, of course, cultish groups, um, whether Mm -hmm. cults or not against everyone else who's in the church, or sometimes one um, one gender over another, so male versus female. So I'm curious what you would have to say in regards to this, because again, it falls under this idea of, is God good or is God oppressive? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, as you look at God and his relationship or the God's people's relationship with, say, the Canaanites or other people's Uh, It is not as though there is some sort of inherent or intrinsic uh, animosity that is built in to their being different. Uh, God is the one who, first of all, creates all human beings in his image. People from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, these are uh, God's image bearers. And of course, male and female, there is a fundamental equality between man and woman. And so there is no hierarchy that we see in the book of Genesis. Uh, and so when we when we look at this, uh, under, and we have this understanding of, the, of how God intends things to be at the very beginning from creation, uh, this is, that there's no classism either, uh, that there is no us versus them. All human b- beings bear the image of God. When it comes to the Israelites, uh, keep in mind what is ultimately bringing, driving this this plan forward is that God has a plan, has a purpose for all of the nations, that every, that all the families of the earth, God desires to bless, and that God reminds the Israelites that it's not because of their intrinsic superiority that he is choosing them, uh, but uh, but it, because they are a stubborn and rebellious people. Uh, he's not picking them because they are better than, than everybody else. Uh, and in fact, as we see the Israelites uh, go along, we are reminded over and over again, 36 times in the Pentateuch, uh, in the Law of Moses, we see that God is reminding the Israelites that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt. And therefore, you are to look out for the orphan the widow and the alien, those who are most susceptible to abuse, those who are most susceptible to being taken advantage of, you are to look out for them first and foremost. Remember how you were abused in the land of Egypt, and, 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 and God is saying, don't let that happen in the, within, your, uh, within your, the land of Israel. Look out for those who could be easily taken advantage of. So there is this, so when it comes to the Canaanites, there is a willingness that God has. He is open to their coming into uh, the, being incorporated into the people of Israel. So God is not hostile uh, to them. It's simply their actions rather than their ethnic identity. And we see, of course, uh, God at the very you know, as he's making a covenant with Israel and uh, identifying himself after they've even, Israel has rebelled against God. Uh, God said that he is gracious, and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And yes, he will not be the guilty unpunished, but he is also revealing himself as giving priority to showing love and compassion. And that's why Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because he, you know, the enemies of Israel, because he's afraid that God is going to show mercy to them if they repent. And that's the last thing that he wants. So that's why he's running away. And in chapter four of Jonah, uh, he said, I knew you're going to do this when God doesn't d- bring judgment upon Nineveh. He says, I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Uh, and so we see that there is this awareness that God has this uh, identifying attribute uh, that that, sp- that spills over into affecting other nations as well. So God is also, keep in mind, God is also uh, going to bring judgment upon the, the people of Israel. It's not as though he says, it's, uh, it's, it's you who can do no wrong and those other guys, and I'm going to beat up on them. 
God says, I will, you will go into exile if you act in the same way that the Canaanites have. Uh, so just as I, I'm going to draw, I drove them out or vomited them out of the land. Uh, so you too will be vomited out of the land, which is basically referring to their having to go into exile. Uh, and so these are some of the things that uh, we ought to keep in mind that there is no ethnic uh, sexual uh, hierarchy here. In fact, the Israelites themselves, we can talk about them as being within Israel. There's not, not a hierarchy that all people uh, are to be, to have the same regard for the law that unlike other ancient Near Eastern cultures, which had a hierarchy and different punishments that co corresponded to that hierarchy, it is the same for all Israelites. So Israel has a, a democratized understanding of the law, that there's a fundamental equality uh, man and woman, uh, you know, all people, uh, all you know, the, the, you know, there's no classism here. Uh, all people are to follow the laws that God has made, and that kings and others are not exempt just because they are rulers of the people, and so on. Mm. Continuing to look at Scripture, if someone is trying to serve the Lord, they're giving it their best, but they keep messing up in whatever way, despite these efforts. Would it align with God's character to, I'm taking this far, Paul, but that's for a reason, to smite them? Again, this is something that we hear. So, and I had an example of this for myself with my, my upbringing in a pseudo-Christian cult where I believed if I walked into a real church building, because we did house churches, if I walked into a real church building, that would be sinful. And because I was sinning, God was going to come at me. Uh -huh. So there wasn't you know, really grace and, and mercy and understanding. And when we consider people's actions and their heart intention, you know, their, their heart positions, how would you respond to this? Because I recently heard a group's sermon using, um, and this appears to be a mainstream church. So I want to say that too, using Cora and number 1632 is an example for how, if people are not obedient um, ultimately to the leadership of the church that essentially figuratively, at least, you know, the earth's going to open up and, and swallow them and their, their families whole. So how much does heart position and those associated intentions for someone matter? Hmm. Yeah, th that we, I think it's helpful to understand, say, even at the end of the book of Jude, that, uh, that, you know, that we are to show compassion, you know, also Galatians chapter uh, six verse one, that if you see someone who is overtaken in a fault, the person who is spiritual, that person who has the spirit of God, is to restore that person in a spirit of gentleness, lest you also be tempted. So there is this humility that is to go with any sort of confrontation of someone who is involved in sin. And to discern what the, what is actually going on. A lot of times we can misjudge what is going on in the situation. And so just to talk to that person, uh, to find out what is happening is important. That gives us more context to go on. Uh, Jesus himself said in, in Matthew 7, he said that we are to, you know, we're, we're, he said, don't judge lest you also be judged. And that we are to, uh, when, when he says, you're, when you're trying to take the speck out of your brother's or sister's eye, uh, first, take the log out of your own eye, uh, examine yourself. That is the position to take, uh, that you are to look to yourself first and recognize that you are a sinner who is in, in need of God's grace, just like the next person is. And so these are to inform our thinking. And the same thing in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where uh, Paul gives these examples of those who have rebelled in the wilderness, who have defied God, who have been ungrateful, and so on. And so God brings judgment upon them. Uh, but he also says, uh, if you think you stand, take heed, lest you fall. And how many times have we seen people who are making pronouncements from the pulpit or uh, from, you know, from their positions of authority, uh, only to find out that they themselves have been involved in in acts that are morally compromising and so forth. Uh, so so they need to examine themselves and approach this with greater humility. Uh, but when it comes to the whole uh, smiting thing, it's not to deny that God doesn't bring judgment upon people. Uh, sometimes he will do so to illustrate a point uh, uh, and to maybe set set off alarm bells for people, like he does bring judgment upon Ananias and Sapphira. 
Uh, but but again, it's 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 um, uh, not as though this is what God desires to do. It's not as though this is God's ideal. And of course, you do have apostolic authority behind these sorts of things. That this is something very sobering. And of course, it's early on in the life of the church, and so uh, so it's a reminder to to set the proper course for the church. But uh, but the the whole idea that oh if you make a misstep God is going to uh, is going to hammer you uh, that that doesn't sound like the the spirit of, of of Jesus who is one who shows compassion to those who are struggling uh, those who and and, and you know, we read uh, of not only of Jesus who says come to me who are weary i'll give you rest or it's you know in matthew 18 uh how many times should i forgive my brother well forgive him as, as often as he sins and and comes and and seeks repentance uh that's the spirit uh that god shows and so jesus is calling on this uh calling on us to remember how great a debt we have been forgiven uh, the parable of the unforgiving servant where this king who is owed literally uh two over you know around two hundred thousand years worth of wages uh and he forgives that debt and then this servant goes out and wants to uh to to choke someone because he can't pay a debt of say less than half a year's wages and so the the, the point is that if you have been forgiven that much then you ought to uh, be willing to show forgiveness to those who uh, are, are are in this difficult situation, but are willing to uh, to repent. For example, uh, so that's the kind of picture that we have going on here. That uh, that Jesus is gentle; uh, he can be rough with those who oppose him and think they can get away with stuff. Uh, but for those who repent, for those who come and humbly to to Jesus. Uh, the best kind of posture to have, acknowledging your sin. Uh, Jesus shows mercy. Jesus shows kindness. He shows grace. And that is the kind of message we ought to be proclaiming, that uh, it is the grace of God that instructs us to deny uh, worldliness and ungodliness uh, and so forth, that those are the types of things that we need to keep in mind, that it's grace that ought to instruct us. And that lifestyle of grace and gratitude in response is how our own understanding should be formed. And that the uh, the God who calls for church discipline, we acknowledge that, uh, is also one who calls us to do so with that gracious, humble spirit as we confront someone in love. Mm, absolutely. And when I think back to my first experience of walking into a church, I remember standing outside before I went in and I prayed and I was like, Lord, I, I don't know if this is okay or not. I don't know if you're in here or not, but I'm genuinely looking for you. I'm trying mm -hmm. to find right. you. Mm -hmm. And so if this isn't it, please redirect me. Right. And for anyone who's listening, you know, any of our listeners who they're in a situation where they're like, gosh, I, I have questions. And I'm not sure of the answers, but I'm afraid to ask. I'm afraid to go read that book. Maybe that I have, I have set aside somewhere. I'm afraid to even be listening, maybe to conversations like this. If we're genuinely looking for God, ask, we have, we have clearance to ask the questions and listen to the, the podcast and read the books and, and talk to different people and just pray and pray for guidance in that search and pray that God would redirect you. If you're, you know, you're heading in a problematic direction and absolutely always be comparing to scripture. That's, we need the, the checks and balances, of course, of comparing to what scripture is telling us because nothing from God will misalign with scripture. And that of course is important too. And so I just wanted to say that and put that out there as well for anyone who's listening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, again, going back to that very theme of, uh, Christ, not, uh, breaking a, a bruised reed uh, mm -hmm. or his not snuffing out a smoldering wick, uh, that there is that tenderness to Jesus. There is that uh, gentleness to Jesus for those who are uh, truly seeking, uh, truly wanting uh, his help, that uh, that he is the one who can be trusted, uh, that he is not an abuser. Right. Yeah. We don't have to be afraid to look. So 
Last question. This is going to touch a bit on the problem of evil, which we've really kind of done. Um, I don't think there's a way around that in this conversation, but I think it's important to mention here without having to have a complete conversation about it. If God is good, where was he while some man or woman was manipulating his name for their personal agenda? How could he allow the very use of his name in this way? Well, we have certainly strong precedent uh, in scripture, in the words of Jesus, or in the examples of, say, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, of those who are shepherds within Israel, but yet who are acting abusively, that these shepherds are uh, leading, you know, who are acting in destructive ways, who are kind of uh, rather than giving the sheep uh, places to graze, uh, the they are fouling or soiling the water in the in the place where they should be drinking and feeding, and so the so God through the prophet is speaking in very strong terms against that kind of abusiveness, and calling on them to correct their course and to remind, of course, everyone that the ultimate shepherd is God who cares for his people, Israel, who's concerned about, uh, you know, these abuses. Now, some people say, well, why doesn't God simply step in and act and so forth? Uh, and, you know, of course, these are questions that we all uh, ask. Uh, we wonder, boy, if only something had happened, if only God had stepped in, uh, that would have been, uh, that would have rescued the situation, that would have helped those people. Why doesn't God intervene here and there? Well, we're not, we're not denying that God uh, intervenes. We acknowledge that God often does. And uh, when it comes to, say, sickness, disease, uh, the prospects of death, a friend of mine, Craig Keener, has written some marvelous books on how God acts miraculously to rescue people, to bring healing to them, that this is something that God does on a regular basis. Uh, as you read the surveys, you know, millions and millions of people uh, in, you know, they say that there are things that have happened when they pray in the name of Jesus that could not, uh, could not be explained in purely naturalistic terms. And so these things have been documented. And again, not that absolutely everyone is, is you know, speaking accurately, but, but we see that there's a, a loud, large and loud chorus of people who are recognizing that God has indeed acted. So, so we, we, we need to note that God does those sorts of things. When it comes to the, the why doesn't God intervene in this or that situation, well, I think ultimately we will have to recognize that while we don't know why God doesn't intervene in this or that situation, God has generally intervened to rescue a fallen, broken humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, that God has gotten his feet dirty, his hands bloody in order to rescue us. And that, uh, and, and again, for those who say, uh, how, I, I can't believe in a God who would allow this to happen to my child, Again, I'm I'm very sympathetic for those cries of the heart where people have lost loved ones close to them, lost children, and I interact with people who who ask those sorts of questions, and I, I want to find out about their story and listen to them uh, before I jump in, uh, as it were, with uh, with what could sound like pat answers if you haven't really sat where people sat and try to listen carefully. Uh, but if we, but here are a few things to keep in mind if we say give up on God because he doesn't act in the world or uh, because the problem of evil isn't resolved uh, into our, you know, according to our timetable and satisfaction. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that if we get rid of God, we're actually making matters worse for ourselves rather than better. If we think getting rid of God is going to give to us newer, better, clearer answers to resolving the problem of evil, think again. Uh, if we, it's, it's sort of like what Peter said in, at the end of John chapter six, when these uh, followers of Jesus, you know, those who have been believing in him, turn away from him. They walk away, they leave. And Jesus says to his own disciples, will you also leave me? 
And Peter says, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You get rid of Jesus, you get rid of the gospel, you get rid of God. You're only exacerbating the problem. So the, and the question really to ask here is not which faith, which worldview, which philosophy of life answers all of my questions regarding evil, because every, of course, every worldview has to address the problem of evil. It's not as though the Christian has a burden and the person who's not a Christian has no burden to bear when it comes to addressing the problem of evil. We can ask the question, well, how does your worldview address the problem of evil? That's a more that's a, a fundamental question that we all have to be asking. And when it comes to the biblical faith, we see that there are resources within the gospel that give to us resources that other worldviews simply do not have. For example, if you reject God, if nature is all the reality that there is, for example, why think that there is any such thing as good or evil? You see, evil is a departure from the way things ought to be. But if there is no God, if there is no standard, no design plan, then there is no way things ought to be. Things just are what they are. Uh, as Richard Dawkins says, it's no, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Uh, and also, if we get rid of God, we get rid of the very basis for human value. We have all been made in the image of God. And if we get rid of God, how do we account for the emergence of value from valueless processes? Why well, think that any value should emerge at all if we're simply the products of valueless processes? You see, the very problem of evil presupposes the dignity and worth of human beings. But where does that come from in a, you know, in a godless universe? Also, we have, as I said, a God who steps into our world and seeks to redeem that world. And then through that redemption and brings bring us into relationship with himself, uh, tells us that even though we will have affliction and trouble in this world, one of my favorite verses is John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And if... We, you know, all, everyone will have trouble. We live in a broken world that is, and this brokenness is not going to be resolved until Christ returns. And so if we think that our model of the, you know, world is a one world model, and that, that the problem of evil has to be resolved within this world alone, and if it isn't, then it's unsatisfactory, we're, we're actually looking in the wrong place. If there is a God, however, who guarantees that cosmic justice will be done, that all tears will be wiped away from our eyes if we put our trust in him, this two-world understanding of things can actually be a, an important corrective to those who are struggling with the problem of evil, that if there is no God, then Hitler and Mother Teresa end up in the same place. They die no cosmic justice done. But if there is a God who exists, he guarantees that justice will be done, that people will not get away with murder or whatever millions of times over. God guarantees that justice will be done. But if there is no God, that won't happen. There will be no cosmic justice. You are just stuck with these inequities, these injustices, and that's just the way it is. So, so as you look at this bigger picture, and even though we can't say, oh, that's why God permitted that evil to happen, uh, we, we don't know. In fact, Jesus himself doesn't tell us when he's asked in Luke 13, uh, why, why, did, why did those people die in the temple when Pilate mingled their blood with the sacrifices, these Galileans? And Jesus said, do you think that they were worse sinners than the rest? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Same thing with uh, this tower that fell on, uh, this tower of Siloam that fell and, and killed 18 Israelites. And Jesus said, do you think that they were worse sinners than other Israelites? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So Jesus doesn't actually give us the answer to why this or that evil happened, a, a moral evil and a natural evil. But Jesus said, let this be an occasion for you to put your trust in God, to make sure that you are rightly aligned with God. And I, I appreciate what C.S. Lewis said, that uh, in, this, uh, in this world, 
uh, that God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And if we understand that you know, a lot of times people won't put their trust in God until something terrible happens, and they realize I just don't have the resources in my own worldview to make sense of this. A friend of mine, uh, by the name of Darren, he had experienced the loss of both. He was an atheist, PhD in mathematics, uh, had experienced the loss of both his mother and his sister within the same year. And he had just assumed that, well, they're just organisms passing through life, that they just have no more significance than anybody else. But he realized that when they died, it just struck him so hard. He said they can't be just biological organisms that come in you know, and out of life, that there's something profoundly valuable about who they are and about their significance to me. And so it was an event like that that actually prompted him to think, I've got to have a worldview that better makes sense of their value and dignity than what I've got going on here. The Christian faith makes a lot better sense of them being made in the image of God, uh, you know, of their value and dignity than what my own worldview had to offer. So, so again, we're if you look at the bigger picture, it I think can help give some important perspective. And even if we can't answer those specific questions about why did why didn't God intervene there or why didn't God act there, uh, we do have a bigger picture of the resources that are found in the gospel, and that these can offer to us staying power resources, the reminder to per persevere. And, and as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, that we are to look to Jesus, the author and uh, completer of our faith, who for the joy set before him, you know, endured the cross, despised the shame, and has set, you know, and sat down at the right hand of God. And so it is to, that as we look to him, who endured such opposition to sinners, uh, that we can be inspired, we can be encouraged and not lose heart. Thank you.